Hello, welcome. I'm very excited to see you all here at this webinar on how to solve climate change by 2030. My name is Laura Burgers. I work as an assistant professor here at the University of Amsterdam at the law department. And I'm very happy to be a member of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies. And somebody else who is in this Amsterdam Center for European Studies is Robin Schutzel, with whom I organized this uh, webinar today. And Robin is in the communication department. He works on a PhD research on climate change communication and is looking at where we stand now in the public debate on climate change. And he will tell us more about the background of this webinar. All right, thank you, Laura. So, um, you know, observing the public debates a few, few months back, I was very happy because uh, I got an email from some colleagues uh, from New York, actually. They were organizing an initiative where they felt, okay, we really need to talk more about what do we actually need to do to deal with climate change. Uh, and they thought they're gonna, you know, kickstart that conversation or try to have a positive impact on that conversation by arranging um, webinars all across the globe. And by now it's 125 universities that are participating and they're hoping to attract more than 100,000 people actually talking this week and next week. Uh, and the second goal they, they uh, pursue with this is to provide some material that students in other universities and in schools can then use uh, to discuss uh, these issues in their classes and in the classroom. And that's also certainly something I, I uh, support. So I thought, yeah, this is great. Let's invite some of the speakers that I would like to see uh, on a panel like this. And um, we found some really great ones. And I'll start by introducing the first two and then I'll hand it back to Laura, um, who will kick us off in the first round. So first of all, it's a great pleasure to have with us Gert-Jan Kramer, sorry for butchering Dutch names, uh, it's still difficult for me. gert is a professor of energy supply systems at Utrecht University, um, where he does research on how to get the energy systems and get industry as a whole carbon neutral. Um, he also is the leader of what's called the Deep Decarbonization Hub, which really looks at these sectors um, and, and gets them where they, need, where they need to be. I actually read on his profile that uh, he has a background in physics where he has a PhD and that he previously worked uh, at Shell. So he doesn't definitely has a lot of good insights into this sector. Um, and I think we could have great conversations already on that basis. Um, but we have more people. We have Marianne Stauffer. She's um, the leader of the program on green cities at Wageningen University. I think it's called Wageningen University and Research because the university works a lot with societal partners, with industry partners, with business partners, with activists. Um, and her focus lies really on how do we change cities? How can we turn them into circular economies that are climate adaptive and that um, provide a healthy living environment? I also read that you're doing research on the interlinks of uh, climate change and migration. I think that will probably also come back in this this discussion later. So very glad to have you two. Um, Laura, please introduce the other two, one of which we cannot see yet. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Robin. So indeed, uh, our third speaker is gonna be Bas Eichhout, who is a member of the European Parliament for the Green Lefts uh, since 2009. He will join us later because he had a very pressing obligation now, but he will come in the seminar uh, in uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, I am personally a bit, bit of a fan of him because he also studied chemistry and environmental science. He's one of those politicians who truly knows what he's talking about. So um, he often makes nice podcasts, mostly in Dutch, about his work. And uh, those are very interesting. He also wrote a nice book called Klimaat Mores in Dutch, and he recently also published a climate manifesto, which is very interesting, but he will join us later. And we are, of course, uh, also very much honored by the last, but definitely not least of our speakers, Verle Engel, who is a board member of Jongere Milieu Actief, which translates as Youth Environment Active. And they are the youth department of the Dutch branch, a uh, uh, branch of Friends of the Earth, uh, which in the Netherlands is called Milieu Defensie. 
and uh, Verla studied anthropology, sociology, and philosophy in Australia. And she also did international development studies here in Amsterdam at the university. So uh, that's it for our speakers. I will give a very small overview of what we will to do today. So we'll have three rounds where we come back to the, uh, our very knowledgeable panel. And in between, we want to get back to you, the audience, uh, to gain also some insights and perhaps questions that, that you may have. Just to add to that, um, as an audience, you can use the Q&A button. It should be on the bottom of your screen. Um, then you can pose a question uh, and I can read that question to our speakers. Um, you can also just write, I have a question and then I will uh, later give you voice to actually speak out your question and potentially switch on your camera. Um, otherwise, uh, feel free to just enjoy. We'll also have this little Mentimeter engagement that uh, allow us to collectively brainstorm, but uh, you'll see about that later on. Yes, we'll get back to that because now we will, of course, start with the first round um, and the first round uh, of questions to the panel. And the key question that we want to pose here is, can you please identify for us what are the top three concrete policy changes that should happen in Europe and the Netherlands in the coming 10 years? Um, so why sh should we focus on these points? And I would like to ask Gert Jan, Kramer, whether you would want to start. Yes, thank you, uh, Laura. Um, happy uh, to be here. So thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me. Uh, three points. I don't know if they are necessarily the policy points, but I do think that they are important for us as a society collectively. And um, the first one is actually sounds a bit at odds with um, the, the purpose of the conversation here is solving climate by 2030, but I think you are misleading yourself if you think that this is something that we can fix in a decade. Uh, um, may, maybe for historic uh, reference, because we have, I guess, a fairly young audience. In uh, 2008, uh, Al Gore, a Nobel Prize winner, former vice president, had a plan to repower America in 10 years. Uh, now, he was arguably a very powerful man. This was the Obama era, 2008, repower America in 2010. A lot of good things happened, uh, but America was not repowered. And repowered is only part of uh, solving climate change. So really, for me, uh, the, the gold standard is uh, to get on a line to, uh, to zero emissions, be carbon neutral by 2050. That in itself is tremendously challenging. And I think even then we only get there uh, by, as we say in Dutch, uh, Kunst and Vliegwerk, right? So uh, uh, all things going, not, not everything ideal, right? But we'll manage if we concentrate ourselves. And so I think for policy, uh, rather than politicians bickering about what percentage it should, should be in 2030, which is really, uh, the next government after the government that we're now talking about is completely pointless. So all that matters is get on a straight line to zero in 2050. And how do you measure that? Well, by doing more uh, to drive down emissions year by year. That is all that counts. And it also means in every year, uh, make choices about what you can do about this year. Uh, so arguing about uh, how good it would be to have something in 10 years is pointless for the here and now. It's all precisely because we need pace to do it in the here and now. That's one thing, be clear about uh, timelines. Then the second um, big thing, I believe, which we haven't got right, but which we need to get right, is um, to have more uh, guidance, or as we call say in Dutch, regie, about uh, the direction from uh, central, from, shall we say, the government for simplicity. Uh, and the reason I say that is that um, the energy transition is really a system transition. It, it only works uh, if everybody can do their parts and if it all interlocks seamlessly. And I think we find ourselves at an unfortunate point in time uh, where for decades since the 1980s, we've had very much a retreat of government and leave it all to the market. But this is a problem and a challenge uh, that is not 
very well suited to be treated like this. So the government really has to step up in this game and be more directive than they presently are, whether we like it or not and how, but they have to reinvent. Uh, we have to reinvent it. A final thing, which is more preparatory in this decade than actual thing, is to uh, envisage, well, what would 2050 be like? Uh, because I think, I believe, energy is so fundamental to how we're organized and how we live as a society, uh, that a zero carbon society is really fundamentally different. And uh, for now, for this decade, we can sort of tweak a bit, but, but for the dec two decades thereafter, we'll really be confronted with fundamental choices. Uh, and they are how much renewable energy, does that automatically translate in how much energy in total? What, what about nuclear? What about carbon capture and storage? Do we all want it or do we want only bits of it? Uh, um, how we will reorganize our economy? Should our economy still keep growing? Um, if it's based on materials and industry, how much of that? Those are fundamental questions that uh, at least we have to envisage uh, and try to get into a dialogue uh, at a societal level about what we want and ideally uh, be able to articulate that in difficult, I think ultimately political visions of how to na navigate through the decades after 2030. My three points, thank you. Thank you very much, Gert-Jan. Uh, that's very insightful and I'm I'm very curious to hear more about what your standpoint would be within that dialogue, but we perhaps will get to that uh, later, because now I will give the floor to Marianne. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marianne Stuyver, as was said in the introduction, and I want to start with point one, which is that we need a radical inclusive change. Um, and I mean radical that, uh, although gert says we can't fix it in a dead decade, I think we at least have to really put all the effort together to fix it in a decade because my experience is that we really like to postpone these type of measures um, as we have also seen in the last years in the Netherlands so one of the first thing that I want to say is that we have to we need change at all levels all people have to change and there are many aspects to these changes um, for instance uh, one of the things uh, there's always very striking to me is uh, I'm an academic, but I actually believe that every scientist that has a bit of knowledge of what's happening with climate change should be an activist, not inseparable anymore. So, um, and where do you start? Well, I think we have a brilliant opportunity now at the moment in the Netherlands to start with reimpose re the Minister of Environment and having a committee of inclusive environmental change or inclusive cl climate change. So we are actually at a point of decision now and this minister of environment should be maybe as important as the prime minister, because I think it should be point one on the agenda of all the ministries to look at what they're doing, what could, what could, could uh, uh, get us to the goals we're aiming for. And then what should be, uh, what should be on the first priorities of this minister, it should be tackle the big industries, um, tackle agriculture, but also and um, make people understand that uh, if we engage in climate change, this will, this will cause new employment, new possibilities and new forms of participation. So um, another point, the last point, so the first point is minister that tackles uh, the big causes of the problems. Second, um, engage everybody at all levels to be part of these changes. And the third one is very crucial. Let, let the Netherlands take a real good place on the international agenda again. Um, I think that a lot of people that suffer from climate change at the moment are also outside our boundaries and not only in the Netherlands. And I think international awareness should be really, really, really getting bigger again. Uh, and we should focus on that uh, on that much, much more. I've done some research on uh, climate refugees and also the situation of people in refugee camps or as migrant cities, and there the uh, people suffer literally uh, from the effects of climate change. Uh, and we cannot, uh, even if you're selfish enough to say, well, we need to deal with it because otherwise people will come to Europe. Uh, 
which I do not agree with, then you still have to look at people's livelihood and how to improve it. Um, so I want to phrase like, uh, I don't understand that there are so many diff people make differences between scientists, uh, citizens and policy makers, et cetera. We are all having the same task for the, the next years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, for those very clear three points. Then we move on to Verde. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to start with a little disclaimer. I'm not an expert, nor am I an authority on any of the things I'm about to say, but I will take this opportunity to express my critical point of view as a young activist. Um, my point is less about practical ways of achieving, of achieving things like carbon neutrality than really a critique of the current uh, debate about climate change. And when thinking about where the priorities are for the coming 10 years and what should be done in the Netherlands as well as internationally, I really only have one point to make and that is that in order to solve the climate crisis, we first need to tackle the crisis of what I call um, the, the crisis of representation. And what I mean by this is that I think the dominant debate about uh, the climate crisis and climate change solutions is neither representative nor inclusive enough of the perspectives and experiences of those who've been and continue to experience climate change most directly, most of whom are indigenous and other voices and peoples of color. Now, it goes without saying that all of us here are um, here today because we are truly concerned and we're truly committed and we care a great deal for our futures, but simply because a lot of us in the West are physically removed from this crisis, particularly within the corporate and neoliberal political spaces, it is difficult to fully grasp the urgency of climate justice on a personal level. The brunt of the climate crisis is currently disproportionately borne by those who've been undergoing the devastating and life-threatening effects of mass environmental destruction. So um, if we want to have a conversation about how to reach, for example, carbon neutrality, it's crucial that this sense of urgency becomes so widespread that it becomes an undeniable fact. So we need to therefore adopt what is called planet-wide thinking. This is a point that we, ex we explore in our climate manifesto um, written by Yema along with activists, um, including indigenous activists and along with political youth organizations. So we need to go beyond the boundaries of our own future oriented climate thinking. It's about what's going on right now, what's been going on for centuries. And we do this firstly by listening to and creating space and giving up space for those already undergoing this firsthand. Um, and this, of course, goes much further than representation. Hundreds of years of pillaging the earth would not have been possible had black and brown voices been valued equally. Had indigenous and other people of color been valued equally, we probably wouldn't be here. And had their voices been included in conversations about climate justice and climate solutions from the start, it's likely we would have felt this um, sense of urgency much more acutely. Um, and so when we talk about climate injustice, so often we refer to the problem that those who contribute least to the climate crisis are the ones to bear the heaviest burden. I would not call this um, climate injustice, but climate racism, which is at the very root of climate change. So we can't really talk about solutions without addressing this critical fact. Um, and we can only seriously talk about climate justice when we include in the conversation the most important stakeholders those who've been most directly and personally affected by climate injustice. Yes, the polluter needs to pay and yes, carbon neutrality is crucial, but we first need to value the lives and the voices of black and brown peoples. And this will mean that we have to confront our own colonial histories and their effects on our shared presence. Not only are indigenous perspectives uh, neglected, most often indigenous people are directly and most heavily affected by climate injustice. For example, while 5% of the world popu world's population is indigenous, up to 97% of deforestation is on indigenous land. Um, and further, while indigenous people are among the most heavily hit, they may simultaneously be the best equipped to tackle issues of climate protection. Um, so why is it that indigenous voices are still excluded from the conversation? And how is it that while we all have the best intentions, um, this conversation is currently being had without Indigenous people at this table. We need to talk about the practicalities of climate change action, but let us also concentrate what, on what got us here in the first place and start to listen to those who've borne the brunt of this for so long. Um, 
organizations in the Netherlands. Um, you know, talk, talk to people, create platforms for dialogue, listen. Only then I think we can begin to have real meaningful conversations about climate justice. Um, and one could say that this is not my story to tell, but I think we have a real responsibility to speak up and not just for our own futures, but for the past and present futures of so many who have gone before us. Thank you. I hope I didn't cut out in the middle there. Thank you so much, Verla, for this very powerful statement. Um, and thank you to, to all three of the speakers uh, for these very, very powerful points. Uh, Verla, I think it's a very valid point that you raised that we should have invited an indigenous speaker here as well. And uh, I know that for the next time I organize an event. Um, it's also very, I think, helpful that you already justice, uh, that you already addressed this term climate justice, because it was the next thing that uh, Robin and I intended to talk about. So what we were planning to do is that Robin and I would say something very shortly about climate justice and then come back with uh, this online tool to um, uh, attain interaction with the audience. Oh, and by the way, Verda, I saw that somebody in the chat was already expressing great enthusiasm for what you were talking about. So that's, uh, that's something that's very nice, I think. Um, so climate justice, I can very much agree with, with Verda that, well, at least, uh, so I have done a research about climate change, litigation, lawsuits about who is or should be responsible for climate change. And in that context, I also looked about, uh, I also looked at this concept of climate justice. And the way I have seen it developing is that it initially was referring to indeed, as Verla pointed out, uh, something that she calls climate racism, this very apparent injustice that those who contributed the most to climate change also profited the most from the industrial revolution, whereas those who suffer the most contributed the least. And this is true, of course, indeed for people, for uh, other people uh, in the world, specifically those from the poorest nations and definitely indigenous peoples. But what I saw happening when I was researching this concept that is that it was also developing to include not only uh, humans that are already alive, but also future generations, those who, not, those who have not yet been born. Uh, and it's clear that even within the future generations, of course, there are groups that will suffer more than others and uh, that Westerners are likely to suffer less and profit still more from the industrial revolution. But of course, in principle, those who are not yet born have not yet contributed to the climate problem, whereas they will suffer more than those who perhaps already died or uh, are alive now. And interestingly, this concept increasingly also refers to everything that is not human. And there it's very clear that, uh, well, all non-human living beings in the world did not contribute to climate change, at least not in the way that, that human beings did, and they suffer the most. So since the 70s, there are 68 less animals alive on Earth. Like the population shrank with 68%, so a small 70%. I think if you have such a number sink in, that is simply daunting. So uh, the way I indeed see this term climate justice or the way I've always understood it is that it refers to this injustice that those who uh, suffer the most contribute the least. And that is true for people in the poorest nations, for future generations and for non-human beings. Uh, but Ruben, you also wanted to add something to this. Sorry, short unmuting problem. Yeah. Um... So over the past years, I've, I've studied a lot of media reporting uh, on, on climate change in my PhD. And what I realized that over these, these years is that the, the conversation of climate justice has also broadened um, even more because in many ways, what we're talking about now is, is who is affected by climate change. And this already in itself throws up a lot of important questions about fairness and justice. Um, and we often think about these in, in, in these groups that we know, like a future generation, or maybe this uh, people from a different country or indigenous folks living in a, in a specific area. But what has become more prevalent is that also within countries, it, for example, raises very big questions. For example, who, who will be able to live in an area that is more or less affected by wildfires or drought? 
that's a, a some people call it a distributive or distributional question. Um, and then the second thing that is really becoming quite prevalent is that we're not only being affected by climate change, but also uh, our last speaker just joined, we'll say hi in a second, um, but also how we are responding to climate change, that is the adaptation that we do and the, the, um, the things we do to actually prevent further damages, to mitigate climate change, to get on the path to zero. These also have very important um, distributional and fairness questions, both at a, at a national and international level. To just give just one brief example, the Netherlands just, uh, I think two years back now, was ordered to um, reduce its nitrogen emissions through housing. Nitrogen is a very potent greenhouse gas, 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And this, this has meant, or at least appeared to, to mean for some time, that there will be really a slowdown in housing construction. Now that we ask ourselves who is affected by this slowdown, it's not the people who already live in their um, owner-occupied houses who are probably a bit older and more affluent, um, but the people who are mostly affected are maybe younger, they may be poorer, they may be of a racial or ethnic minority. So for me, that's really demonstrating how these concrete uh, ways of thinking about climate change and the solutions really interact with these big um, justice questions. On a more abstract and international level, we can, for example, think about, well, should we deny or is it fair to deny some countries the fossil fuel powered development that we've got to enjoy? Um, and what can we offer instead? Um, so that's why I think this, this really plays together. Um, I would like to invite you now to, before we say hi to Bas, uh, to uh, think with us for a second, like some people already started to go there, go to menti.com, open a browser or use your phone, punch in the code and think a little bit like what are some important justice and solution, solution challenges? So I made a typo there no matter. Um, and we'll use that as an input for, for our next round of discussion. We'll just give you one or two minutes to really, this can be a question, it can be the name of a group you think is really affected by this. This can be a, a policy area that we maybe haven't talked about so far. Uh, let me see. Oh, there's some questions here that I haven't seen before. Can you uh, argue or argue into evidence? Yeah. So what will what will happen next as these answers trickle in is that we'll go back to our participants and we'll actually start with Bas, who maybe can also briefly give us his his most important um, changes that need to happen in the Netherlands and Europe. But then we would like to really ask you, based on this input that we're seeing here now, but also your own thinking as, as panelists, you know, what are some of these justice challenges that really are going to, you know, are staring us in the face, so to say, over the next years? And, and um, how, can we, how can we tackle them and how can we deal with them? Robin, I don't know whether you're talking, but you are muted at least, so. Yeah, sometimes Robin and I speak secretly to each other because we're in the same room. Ah, with okay. A proper distance, <laughs> of course. But we were saying to each other that we should perhaps already resume. Uh, Bas, I'm so happy that you're here. 
Uh, I already introduced you and told the audience that I greatly enjoyed your book and that I always trust you as a true authority on climate change. Oh dear. I think <laughs> thanks to your studies, you actually know what you're talking about and I'm ex extremely happy that you're here. Oh, thank you, thank you uh, for having me, I would say, and, and apologies for being a bit late, but uh, I, I had another meeting, so fortunately you don't have to move around anymore, you just have to switch screen, but, but still, uh, you can't do it at the same time, so apologies for that. Uh, I have, of course, no ideas for what had been said, uh, so, so in that sense I, might, I may repeat something, so I will keep it very short on, on what I think are, are really important challenges for Netherlands and Europe specifically. Uh, on, on what needs to happen. And, and since I was asked to come with three, I, I'll give you three. Uh, first of all, it is of course, one of the crucial ones is the transition of our energy intensive industry. Um, if, you, if you see in, in what transitions are already ongoing, and I'm not saying therefore the problem is solved, but you see some changes in different sectors. And I think the energy sector is certainly one of those. We now also slowly see some changes in, into the transport sector. Uh, but I think the energy intensive industry is certainly a, a, a big emitter. I mean, these are the biggest emitters and, and they really need to come up with credible pathways to CO2 neutrality in a, in a very short period of time. And, and that really uh, demands a, a, a complete well, change of the fossil path where they were built, built upon, right? So, and, and I think what is a bit of a sobering point is that a lot of politicians have now said, okay, we want to go to climate neutrality. That target has been embraced now within the EU, but I still have the feeling a lot of politicians really have no idea what they really embraced, because this means something. This means a change of our industrial practices as we know it. Uh, it means a change in all the sectors as we know it, but certainly also for the industry. And I still have the feeling that a lot of politicians say, we need to go to climate neutrality. Uh, and then 2050 is a year attached to it, which I think is relatively late, but okay, it is in 30 years. That means that any investment today needs to go in changing that path, that changing that fossil path each euro that is going to be invested. And I think there, that challenge is not, not fully grasped, I think, by, by a lot of politicians. So certainly the, the energy intensive industry is, is, is a challenge for Europe. The second one that uh, is, is key, and this is also specifically for the Netherlands, it's of course our agriculture sector. Um, if you look at the, the, the footprint of our agriculture sector, and certainly in the Netherlands, where we have been building a sector that is export driven, right? I mean, you hear quite often Dutch politicians talking about that we should feed the world. Um, I think, uh, well, maybe a bit more modesty would be in place, but, but certainly that kind of idea of, of putting that on our agriculture sector is really problematic, not only from a climate perspective, but also from a nitrogen perspective. I jumped in when Robin was talking about nitrogen. Well, I think you cannot avoid then talking about the Dutch agriculture sector which basically what our model means is that we are importing nutrients from all over the world for that we are cutting a lot of forest that is being imported to the Netherlands that we uh, transfer into animal products and we keep the manure, the shit here, literally. And that's our, that's our kind of our agriculture model, which keeps us in the shit, literally. Uh, and I think that that model is not sustainable, cannot survive. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's one of the challenges, certainly for Europe, but also certainly for the Netherlands. And then the third one is much more a change in our economic thinking. I mean, these are sectoral challenges and all that. But I think within Europe, what is our biggest problem is that, and I mentioned it already in the first part, it's, it's, we still don't have a credible investment program at the European level. And this is one of the biggest problems we have at the European level is that there is still this, this idea that, that we should do a lot of saving. It's the austerity that is still a dominant uh, paradigm in, in the European setting, certainly pushed by countries like the Netherlands and Germany. Whereas, as I said, if you're serious about your target setting for 2050, it means a total change of our entire economy. You cannot do that without a very clear political vision 
on an investment program that is really changing how we are putting our investments in place also to make sure and there the social justice comes in if we don't do that in a proper way then what you will see is that the price will be paid by the citizens and not by the big industries because they can always avoid uh, through tax evasion etc the cost etc somewhere the money needs to come from and then it's the the people who will pay for it so if we are not going to change that economic paradigm then i fear very much that the public support for that transition that is required and i think that is having quite some support from the audience from the people but not if they have the feeling that in the end they are going to pay for it and the big polluters not and i think this this paradigm shift is absolutely also crucial for for entire Europe, certainly to reach the goals that, that we have set ourselves. And as I said, uh, still a lot of politicians have not really made the shifts after setting the target that it also means a fundamental shift in, in how we deal with that. And for example, in the Netherlands now after the elections, one of the big challenges is what kind of investment program will we do? And for once, will it be politically guided and not always this kind of liberal dutch idea that leave it to the market they know better uh, and 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 they will they will do the investments and leave the politics out if you do that it means business as usual and you keep the fossil path and i think that mantra really needs to change in europe but certainly also in netherlands because the dutch unfortunately have a big voice on this more liberal attitude in Europe. And I hope that will change in Netherlands and from September on also in Germany when they have elections. Um, so that's my 50 cents to kick off. I have no idea whether it was a lot of duplication. Apologies for that in that case. It, I think it, it was not. And otherwise it, we enjoyed the feast of repetition. Thank you very much, Bas. And uh, Robin, I hand over to you because you, I think, want to say something about the Mentimeter results, right? Uh, yeah, no, my, um, yeah, uh, well, thank you all for, for also sharing your inputs and Mentimeter. I'll try to in include those uh, a little bit into this discussion. Um, I think I'd still like to start with uh, with around where I go through for all the speakers. And next, I, I want to turn to Gerdian because this kind of connects well to what we were just talking about. And also, I want to point you again, you can also write questions in the Q&A here, and I'll try to, to bring them all up um, along the way. Um, so maybe Herdian, you can you can kind of latch on to what Bas was talking about, and, and really I, I would also like to hear from you. How do you think, especially in this really rough transition, let's put it maybe like this, that the energy sector will have to go through? How how does this talking about fairness and social justice play into this uh, in the Netherlands and internationally for you? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, uh, woman. Well, let me say that uh, Bas, uh, who came in uh, after I uh, spoke, that at least I see some commonality in, in what we uh, said for Bas's purpose. Uh, I briefly said that uh, for me, uh, 2050 is the most important target, and I think we need to get onto a straight line to 2050. I think that uh, uh, I heard that echoed in what Bas said that, uh, you know, this is an enormous challenge and indeed politicians don't, don't always seem to uh, understand what they've notionally signed up for. I think in all fairness, you in my introduction, you said I worked in industry, I worked for Shell. I know from talking to industry in general that there is a much stronger awareness about what it takes, uh, which sadly is sometimes then by the public as seen as them being conservative but i think you're not necessarily conservative uh, that they work uh, from a better understanding than politicians of what it takes but uh, i think collectively and this has been in my mind a change since paris since paris uh, there, there is among a very broad range of stakeholders notably also business uh, the, the firm understanding and a uh, strong belief that this must be done and this must be handled uh, firmly but, but steadily. Um, the third point that uh, Bas uh, raised about uh, an investment program that needs to be put in place very much resonates with what I said about this being uh, a systemic change requiring the government to step up because there's a lot of uh, infrastructure, etc., to to uh, to be done. Um, now to the points where perhaps uh, there, there's more debate to be had. Uh, um, I think uh, Boss had um, something to say about social justice. 
not, not about the fundamental, more fundamental aspects of uh, justice, uh, uh, like uh, representation, uh, overtones of colonialism that may go in here, that, um, that, that Vela uh, put on, on the table. But to start with uh, social justice, um, uh, uh, I think what perhaps politicians uh, need to grab is that, in my view, uh, the, the bill which the net bill is actually not that big, right? I mean, I stand by the Stern Review who said it's just 1%, right? But that is very much a netting out of things. And underneath, uh, there are very significant changes of money and of uh, monetary relations. So it's by no means easy financially, but not necessarily by the cost. But I think the cost is basically borne by all of us, but, but in three different capacities, either as consumers or as taxpayers or as shareholders, right? And uh, I think that um, uh, uh, without going in, in, into a too specific a social justice agenda where that takes the overhand, uh, um, I think you would social justice uh, would at a minimum mean that you don't upset the balance between what consumers pay, what taxpayers pay, and what shareholders pay too much. And in that respect, uh, may not be popular in this audience, but uh, I think it's a bit naive to say how the polluter pays, because this brings down to the old 1960s uh, dilemma on the cartoon, the pollu who's the polluter, right? Uh, uh, we've seen the enemy and he is us, right? Ultimately, pollution happens by us or for us. Um, a final thought, perhaps, because uh, I saw it come up in one of the questions, what is um, my response to what uh, Vierle said? I think uh, Vierle indeed made a very powerful uh, argument, and I think it is quite, um, yeah, in many ways disconnected to, to the argument I made. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily want or, or can make a strong connection between the one and the other, but I think it's good to recognize that they can be separate conversations, each of them being relevant. But I wonder uh, if a social justice and uh, uh, a justice discussion necessarily helps uh, the pragmatic problem solving that I was talking about. Well, let me leave at that point. I'm sure there's more to be said, but that is, I think, why uh, it seemed disjunct. It is disjunct. One, I think, comes from a very idealistic uh, perspective and wants to uh, repair, set right certain real things, whereas the other conversation is, well, we have an urgent problem with energy and climate, and we don't have the luxury uh, to first make the world just, never mind the question, was it ever just? Uh, but we have to uh, uh, sort out uh, basically the serious mess we're in uh, with our climate and energy system. Well, thank you, Eric Jan. Um, I think also, I, I, I really think that's something that's important to think about. To what extent do we let ourselves be delayed by discussions in acting? And in what ways are these discussions there to shape how we act? That's kind of the purpose for me with this discussion also. Um, and, and I think one thing that struck me from your first presentations by all of you is that all of you said we need a kind of all hands on deck mentality and all solutions rather than leaving some out. <laughs> but still, I, I would like to also invite Marianne to, to offer some views on, on connecting justice to climate solutions. Uh, and then we'll get back to Vela and then we'll have some audience comments. Uh, and write me if you want to say something if you're in the audience. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Robin. Uh, well, as I already said in the introduction, I think that radical change is inclusive change. Um, and I agree with the point that Vela made that, um, uh, that it should, well, should be top priority. Um, we are actually working on this also how to build inclusive cities, for instance, um, what we see also with the measures that are taken, uh, they do not necessarily go to the, uh, the whole of the Dutch population. You have in all the cities, you have already the Netherlands green gentrification, uh, 
places, uh, people that uh, have more to do with the effects of climate change than other people. So I think that's clear. Um, what we also what we mostly also focus on is uh, like the the development of making circular cities in migrant cities, circular the refugee camps. So also with the huge expansion of urbanization worldwide, it's, it's an excellent opportunity to do to incorporate all the measures from the start. Um, concerning agriculture, I mean, I'm from Wageningen University of Research, so uh, basically uh, this, uh, the design of our agricultural system in the uh, Netherlands and Europe has been done by colleagues from the last hundred years in my university. Um, but we also have now um, much opportunity to have a lot of uh, alternatives to this very polluting agriculture we are having at the moment. Uh, which and what I also frame as um, you could call it retro innovation. So we need to use the knowledge of which, which has been um, put into the background in the agro-industrial regime. We need to get the knowledge to the foreground, and that's knowledge of indigenous peoples. Um, you can see, for instance, in agroecology, in permaculture, there's a lot of knowledge how to restore, um, restore the soil, restore the agricultural practices. And that also involves a new economics. So an economics that not only takes output in terms of milk, meat, um, whatever, but especially money, but also an economics that takes output as restoration of resources. So how can you have an economic activity and the resources stay intact? I think that's a very important, different line of thinking. Um, and I really want to add that a free market does not exist. It never existed. It's an excuse of people uh, to do nothing. Um, so we need new types of economies. And I think there's already a lot of knowledge available on this and we have to unlock this knowledge. And I think that inclusivity comes in. We really not only um, say we should include people in the decision making or we should look at what everybody's needs are, but we have to make credential knowledge knowledge of all people, local knowledge that is relevant to the situation. Um, and the last point I want to make, um, I said in the beginning, like uh, activism is a very important word. Uh, who calls themselves an activist? In the Netherlands, it's a bit of, sometimes a bit of a nasty word, you know, and I think we should retake that notion of activism and actually say, literally, it means take action. So. Why not say everybody could be an activist? It's not necessarily a left wing or a green uh, standpoint to be it. It's essential that all people understand that we have to have climate action now. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Great. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. And I, I, I also see myself somehow as, a, as an academic slash activist. I do it in my own ways, for example, by organizing events like this. Um, and I think that's also a mentality we can all take. I also want to give more time to Werle, and then we already have a couple of people from the audience who want to speak. Um, can you, you already said a lot of things about climate justice, Werle, but um, I think this is a, another good time to bring it up. Um, probably you've had a lot of thoughts while also the others were speaking. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I'm not going to take too much time here. I just want to latch on to some of the things that Gert, Gertjan was saying. Um, while I agree that a lot of the struggles that we are talking about in, in our current context are very much urgent, I think it's slightly dangerous to disconnect them from struggles that are going on and have been going on for, for hundreds of years in other parts of the world. And in that, to reduce uh, the climate crisis of the global south to a mere social justice issue and, and to in that equate that with being a luxury, an ideological luxury to simply discuss these issues and in that postpone our own issues. I think that is where the real privilege comes to the fore because we have 10 years. People from the global south, indigenous peoples, peoples of color don't have 10 years. In fact, they've already lost so many tens of years and so many brothers and sisters and family members, you know, they're not living on dry lands anymore. They're not living on fertile lands anymore. So to talk about this issue as though it's a luxury is, I think, simply wrong. And that doesn't mean that we don't have to focus on the pragmatic and the practical issues that we can solve right now. I think you're right, they can exist, um, they can coexist, but then 
the focus should be on the co. How can we make sure these issues coexist? How can we make sure that we don't make our own issues more important? The very fact that we're in a global climate crisis is because of our own wrongdoings, and it's it's time that we start we start acknowledging that. So yes, they can exist in the same moment, but we need just as much time, just as much passion, such just as much energy that goes into solving um, them alongside one another. Um, I think there are people in the audience that might have a lot to say about this, so I want to also give them the space to say something if they want to. Um, yeah, actually we have somebody, like uh, two people on the list from the audience, and then maybe I'd also like us uh, the first right to respond to what is being said, because uh, he's been uh, um, focusing on his practical points first. So let me just promote the speaker here. Hello, where are you? Promote the panelist. And now we should be able to, Arthur, would you like to switch on your camera and or uh, video and share your question slash criticism slash comment with us? Hello. Uh, hi, thanks for uh, inviting me to contribute. Um, I'd like to build off a little bit of what Fearless said. And especially lots of, I have some disputes over much of what Gert said, but predominantly the use of the word luxury. And I think that needs to be stressed. Um, it's, it's not really a luxury that Europeans have colonized the African continent for hundreds of years and exploited their mineral wealth, and yeah. which inevitably grew to become the pension funds that you're currently enjoying or will enjoy, um, the, the state of the Dutch economy, in fact, uh, the Dutch Export Credit Agency has Atradius has continued to support fossil fuel projects abroad. The Development Bank continues to do so. FMO through very poor countries in Africa. Abe Pay continues to reap millions of dollars in profits from these companies. And yet now we're pretending like it's a luxury to support a fossil transition abroad. It even that's a very Eurocentric and patriarchal approach to this, and it's incredibly problematic. And so you say, Herrick, you say that there's these two discussions, but they're not. It's the same energy crisis, it's the same climate crisis, and you choose to employ this very Eurocentric approach to it, which essentially means we don't care about the rest of the world as we haven't for the last hundreds of years. Um, and that discussion needs to come to the forefront, which Verily has nice and eloquently begun to do so. The last, I mean, the, the last thing I really wanted to say is this idea of a pragmatic approach. The most pragmatic thing to do with what Bas alluded to earlier, stop financing this stuff and start rebuilding financial models. It's not that difficult of a technical solution. We pretend it is because we don't want to take the financial loss for it. So, I mean, I, I understand that it's, it's technically difficult given the political circumstances, but it's not a technical, it's not pragmatic to reimagine. So I agree with a lot with what Mariana said, but I really would just, I would want to ask Herod once more if, to reply. And if you can even fathom a possibility in which this energy transition problem that you so dearly want to solve can begin to even have some kind of ounce of justice consideration. That's an important uh, element you have to embody, I think. Okay. Thank you, Arthur. Um, I think rather than <laughs> bouncing it back to Bas, since uh, this was very directly directed at you, Gert, I'd like to give you a chance first. Um, and then we'll connect another uh, input from Raki, and then we'll go back to Bas and the panel overall, and then also try to move on to the next set. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, so you want me to speak now uh, briefly? Uh, yes, to yes. This? Yeah, I, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I uh, can say much to uh, soothe uh, the the, um, the 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 sentiments. Um, um, I, I think you know there, there is uh, ever uh, only so much uh, that, that uh, individuals uh, can do uh, to to, uh, to to help change the world for the better. Uh, you, you've clearly chosen uh, one topic. Uh, uh, I have chosen another. Uh, there, there surely is uh, overlap be between the, the one and the other. It's just that my strength uh, is on the more pra pragmatic solving of what is at, at the core, shall we say, a technical problem. I realize that it is a bit uh, simple minded, but I don't have too much uh, to, to say. Uh, I think uh, where you put a challenge to me, uh, I could also turn the, the challenge around and to say, yes, uh, I recognize all of what you're saying, uh, but um, uh, so what will it actually 
uh, well then the, the question turns around is what what does all of what you're saying and what, what you're proposing uh, do to help us actually from here and now other than uh, through the sort of kumbaya moments that we say yes we all agree uh, and I think that is the sort of pragmatism that that I'm hoping uh, to, to to hear from you because pragmatism uh, you said pragmatic is stop stop the financing uh, but why that is not pragmatic is that by simply shouting it it, it doesn't happen uh, so progress usually uh, is made uh, by convincing people by, by uh, building coalitions and with a coalition not just being in splendid theoretical agreement uh, but also doing sensible things uh, that help us uh, help us all uh, from this year to the next. And while I have much sympathy with what you're saying, uh, I see there's a strong, well, fundamental disconnect uh, between what you're saying, what you're, I would say, preaching, uh, uh, and sensible directions uh, of of change, real change, real change. Thank you for that. Could the I say something, the... Robin, or is that uh, rude? Sorry, no, sure. No. Just go ahead. Um, if it's well, I, I find it very interesting what's happening now, to be honest, because I, mm. I do, um, uh, in, in, this, in the argument that Gretchen is making, he's, he's pulling apart in, um, climate justice and, and cl other climate topics. And I don't agree. I think they're the same. Uh, and it's not a matter of, if we all talk together in a good way, we will solve the problem. It's, there's really a disruptive justice aspect to this. It's not right divided. It's, it's unjust uh, division of uh, effects. So it's much more further than that. And you could argue that if you if you look at radical change of the last hundred years of in terms of the human rights movement, it has never become been there through talking with each other. Um, it has been there because people um, wanted to fight that much, for instance, in the women's movement and also in the indigenous movement, they fought so much so that their rights came on the political agenda. And I'm also very curious what Boss has to say about that in, in terms of uh, that the justice agenda should be again high on the European agenda, especially when it comes to the old climate measure. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Marianne. Yeah, I also, in some way, some of this, I just want to share a brief thing. It, it reminds me a bit of some of my uh, early student days when I was more of a radical activist. And we often had these clashes between the so-called realos, we would say in German, the fundis. And people, this kind of translates the realists and pragmatists and the fundamentalists. But I don't think that's a fair characterization. Um, and I think we're all uh, trying here to to find ways to connect this divide maybe a little bit. And I, I would really like to encourage everybody to, to see how we're trying at least to pull on the same, on the same rope, so to say, and not on opposite ends. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I also really like these kind of contentious discussions because I think it's also the moments where we can learn a bit from these seemingly opposed camps. Um, I'll, I'll get another input from Raki and then back to Bas. Uh, Raki, would you like to unmute and maybe camera if you like or not? Cool. Yes, thank, uh, you. thank you, Robin. And uh, good afternoon, uh, panel members. Um, my name is Raki Up, and I'm, I was a candidate for uh, the last uh, elections in the Netherlands for uh, on the green left, for the green left, but also a, a very well known. Um, indigenous climate change activists and this is what i wanted to say just for the experts to understand and those who are you know not for sure that the, the rights of indigenous peoples are basically underlined by the un scientists uh, to be exact i will just uh, read a sentence from the united nations department of economic and social affairs just to uh, give a, a a kick to my to my question uh, the Secretary General said that ensuring the collective rights of indigenous peoples and to lands, territories and resources is not only for the well-being, but also for addressing some of the most pressing global challenges, such as climate change and environmental degradation. 
said UN Chief Economist and Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development. What I want to underline is the words um, uh, my sister made before, is that we must understand where the climate change happened, right? If we wanted to stop it and tackle it, we must know what the root cause is. More than 97% of world's deforestation happens on indigenous lands because of agriculture, for, uh, fossil fuel industries, and I know it, because that is the reason why I fled from my homeland, which is a former Dutch colony, Netherlands New Guinea, which is the world's largest tropical island. And even today, scientists and academics are shocked when I tell them my personal story, how I lost my father. If we don't know what happened on the front line of the climate crisis, which is still happening right there, we are losing our families, our life losing everything you see around us, how are we going to change it? if he doesn't know what is happening there. The problem here, from an indigenous point of view, is that people in the Netherlands and in the global north doesn't feel the urgency, but basically because the stories of indigenous people who have been screaming for more than 100 years since the industrialization started, haven't been heard. And the best protectors, as the UN IPCC say, that they have preserved more than 80% of all biodiversity, which is the next crisis after the climate crisis, is that they're not sitting on the table where the decisions are being made, whether it is about ecosystem restoration, biodiversity, or forest protection. They're the best protectors and they're not sitting on the table. And that's basically why we have coming to this climate crisis in the first place. If we care about their lives and their rights, we didn't have this climate crisis. So that's the fundamental discussion and narrative which we should have started 100 years ago. So still today, if you're saying it's not interconnected, we are not understanding what, what brought us in the situation in the first place. So this is what we should have. And yes, we should collaborate with the knowledge in the global north. But the UN scientists are saying that, you know, protecting forest is as much as important as reducing the carbon emission, right? So if we lose the forest, which we can see is increasing now in Brazil, in the Amazon, but also in West Papua, we will lose the, 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 we will lose the struggle against the climate crisis because we didn't find the courage to tackle the right, you know, the root causes. So my question is for the expert panels, are you agree that when the scientists are saying the rights of indigenous people are as fundamental as, reduce, is, as reducing carbon emission, what do we have to do to bring these important stakeholders to the decision-making tables, nationally or European or international? How do they think about that? Okay, great. Thank you, Rocky. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like actually to also, if this, I think it's a good transition to, to bring it back to Bas because you're, you're one of our representatives. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit about how we could make representativeness more representative, so to say. And, and what, what kind of chances do you see, for example, to, to bringing people to the table, to the decision-making tables? Um, I, I was just thinking of one thing, how this all connects, for example, by uh, a failed deal with between European states and the European Union. And I think it was the government of Ecuador, I'm not entirely sure, who, who basically put it to the table. We could leave some of our oil in the ground, but uh, if, if we are being paid instead, um, that, that would have maybe been one thing. So I wonder what you have to say. Uh, thanks a lot. There's, there's now a lot to be said, to be very honest. Um, um, Maybe let's let's try to bridge a bit. I know maybe people are, what is he doing now? But I try to bridge a bit to Gert Jan. Um, because when you started Gert Jan, I thought, okay, there are uh, we, we we really have some overlap there. But 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 then indeed, in the end, your I would almost say refusal to go into these questions about uh, uh, social justice globally. And then also in your reply to even, well, dodge it, basically, I was a bit surprised there because I thought it gives you a chance to come back to it. And, and, and you did not do that. Uh, and, and, and I think where my problem lies when you said it is that in general, I agree if you say, well, we have to make sure that all these investments that are required, all the costs that need to be paid. I mean, it's not only a cost, but I mean, there are costs in the system. It's a change of a system um, needs to be balanced. I think in general, we can agree on that. And then you mentioned uh, consumer taxpayers and shareholders, right? Um, the problem, however, is it is at this moment totally not balanced. So if you're claiming 
it's now balanced and we should keep it balanced. I think there it goes wrong, or at least there the dis fundamental disagreement comes. And, and this really comes to, uh, to, if you look, and this is a study by the Dutch Central Bank that has been looking at the Dutch financial system. And they concluded that the Dutch financial system as a whole is having half a trillion euros exposure to companies who have a high dependency on well-functioning ecosystems globally. And they're not paying for that. They are super vulnerable. They are super vulnerable to the well-being of ecosystems globally. And that is not taken into the price what they're doing. So in their uh, financial flows, they're not paying for that. And I think this is one of the big fundamental problems that we're having is that all these pollutions and all these vulnerabilities are not equally distributed. And if you're saying, well, now let leave it to the companies who can now steer us away from a fossil pathway, I think then we have a fundamental discussion on, on but this, this really on this distribution, we, have a, we need a much more fundamental debate. And that brings me a bit to the European level. And then I come to the Raki's points on, on representation. Um, social justice at the European level is very poorly uh, addressed. And I know it's sometimes very popular to blame Europe for that, but it's how we constructed Europe. Bear with me, we constructed an internal market where consumers are profiting from it. I don't think anyone can deny that we are profiting from this one market that we created because products can be consumed cheaply. And that, at the first glance, could be say, well, we all profit from that. However, the companies who, of course, also profiting from that are also profiting that it's one labor market. So they can choose and they can go to where the labor is the cheapest. But our taxation system is still nationally oriented because, you know, that's, that's the sovereignty. We don't want to give that to the European level. That's national sovereignty. The consequence is that each company, each country, when they have to pay for something, when to have to raise the revenues, they are not raising the taxes on companies because they can choose the country where it's the lowest level. So the countries are profit or the companies are profiting from a kind of a heaven on earth, one internal market, labor market, which is European. However, tax services, they can play the countries against each other with the result that the tax levels on companies has gone down. And gert -Jan, you cannot deny that. The trend of taxation on companies has gone down decades, 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 with the consequence that in crisis time, when governments need to raise taxes, they do that on consumption or labor. So this unfairness in distribution is in the construct of how we constructed Europe at the European level already, let alone at the global level. And if we are not going to address that and are saying, well, that's, that's one problem, but we have to solve now climate and the transition to low carbon or zero carbon, then this fundamental inequality will burst. And I think you saw it already in France, which was the tiny resistance that you saw there, but it will be a global resistance. And that's, I would say, short-sighted if we are not going to try to solve that together. And that then brings me how to solve it. And that's the most complicated one, right? Because the representation is a very good point that Raki made. But the problem is that all our decision systems, both at the European level, but certainly also at the global level, is constructed by national states. I mean, the UN, the national state is sacred. Any attempt to talk about regional representation is being fought back by countries who are afraid that that means support for all kind of independent movements. It's already in Europe. As soon as you talk about, you know, some regional representation, you've got Spain blocking it because they are very much afraid that we'll do something to Catalonia. They are still not uh, acknowledging Kosovo, for example. I mean, these are just very simple examples on how to show that this national construct is so dominant in how we constructed things. 
which I think um, we cannot avoid right away. And here I, I was also intrigued, Robin, of course, by Fundis and Realos. I think we need both indeed. We need Fundis to address this and kick the system and then probably some people within the system trying to change that. So you need them both, but you need people who every time address this and erase this problem, this fundamental problem that we are having in, so in our construct on which is leading to a less taxation system on companies and more and more on labor and uh, consumption. So this increasing uh, inequality that we are seeing, but at the same time also how we do decision making, which is indeed constructed to entirely by national states, both at the European level and certainly at the UN level, even more at the UN level. Um, I mean, try to talk with China on maybe go a bit beyond the national states, they're not open to that. So, I mean, this is, this is, this is one of the more fundamental problems that, that is difficult to, to save, but I think when we are talking about the transition to a new economy, we cannot avoid to have both discussions at the same time. And there I really hope that Gert-Jan can you know, come back a bit and say, okay, okay, maybe I was a bit misunderstood. Gert-Jan, can you briefly respond? And then I, I'd like to steer the discussion a bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I uh, think other... that was, uh, could easily be uh, misunderstood. And, and certainly uh, because uh, I, I will confess that um, I, I'm slightly out of my uh, comfort zone in the sense that I mostly talk about uh, the uh, technical fixes, even though I'm uh, definitely aware of uh, the, the, uh, the, the social uh, problems. Uh, but uh, one of the downsides of that is that sometimes your words uh, lack certainly an improvisation uh, of, of subtlety. Still, uh, to, to uh, on the one hand, give in. So I, I'm fully with what Bas uh, just said, uh, that uh, uh, when, when I say uh, that there is, when I said there is this split up between who pays as a consumer, uh, as a taxpayer, or as a shareholder, uh, that's a fundamental notion, I would agree. Uh, that's uh, in, in it's totally out of whack at the moment, uh, but indeed solving that um, might well be uh, useful anyhow. But but clearly that is an economy wide issue. Uh, it's not even a European but a global issue. I think uh, I've been thinking about uh, what what can I say to uh, sort of perhaps uh, yeah uh, avoid that uh, the. We, we get totally derailed in the conversation and don't talk uh, to each other anymore and try to find common ground. So I think where uh, the issue and um, is perhaps is helpful to uh, look at what uh, the good old President uh, Eisenhower said, if you have a problem that you can't solve, make I make the problem bigger. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, yeah, that that's what we're doing, right? I started out my conversation of what I thought was a pretty big problem already. Uh, let's, for the sake of simplicity, say the technical problem of fixing climate and energy. And another said, no, that is not, uh, that, that is just a partial problem. Uh, there is global justice, there is social justice in the EU and, and elsewhere. And uh, so that's, we can all agree that that makes it a bigger problem, right? And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, my little problem is uh, a subset of that, that wider problem. I think where I stand my ground is that I am not sure uh, that this is a class of a small problem and a big problem where Eisenhower's dictum uh, still holds that you make the solution easier by making the problem bigger. That's, I think, as good as I can say where I stand. And that also uh, justifies uh, my daily work uh, and try to work the, the big enough technical problem uh, without dismissing that there are other problems. It's just that I don't say, well, I personally don't know how to also handle that and speak to that or, or do something uh, that is constructive. And that is uh, why I stay in my pretty big niche can I just, Robin, before you, apologies for, but but just, and then, then you can do that, but just to react to Gert Jan, to, to say, and, and this I want to stress, when you said uh, um, in your area of the technical problem, which indeed already is a big one, right, going to climate neutrality, 
is a fundamental change of our current practices. So that is a fundamental problem in its own, and it's a big problem. Um, there, I just want to stress, and there I really want to resonate on what Gert-Jan said, is that my experience indeed is that some of the companies are already much further than many politicians. Quite often, the resistance is more at the political level than at the company level. I'm not talking for all the companies, but I'm certainly seeing that there is a shift in minds within companies, and that goes faster than with politicians, unfortunately. I mean, I am a politician, and I have to say, I sometimes see that we are becoming the laggards in, in this transition, which is a bit of a sorry conclusion, if that's your, your ground where you work. I think the point here and there, uh, I can understand what you say, hey, try to stay in your comfort zone, I understand. But the problem here is, of course, this is such a fundamental change that the question how are we going to make money to invest in it? Who is going to pay for it is a crucial fundamental part of it. And that makes the problem indeed bigger. And I think that's where a lot of the questions were about. And there, of course, you can say, well, I try to prefer to stay there. But I think indeed this question on how to share the burden and how to make sure that we are not increasing the inequalities that we are already having in our society which is really a kind of a, a which is one of the one of the societal problems that we're having there we cannot escape to tackle that at the same time in order to create that space for that transition and i think you do not disagree but you well feel less comfortable in that second field which i can understand because it is indeed getting more complicated and now i shut up robin <laughs> Thank you, Ross. Definitely appreciate it. I just felt like since we're we're getting uh, it's getting a bit later, and uh, I think most of you agreed that you have a little more time. Can could we could we have five minutes more than uh, half past four from all of you? Awesome. Uh, I I just wanted to you you said something before, but there was said um, you know there's maybe some of us who 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 are kind of more pragmatic and in the system, and in some ways all of us who are sitting here, maybe with the exception of Verla, I don't know. Um, where you are right now, um, are really part of the system. Marianne is a professor at the university. Herdian is a professor at the university. Bas is a member of the European Parliament. I'm a PhD at a university uh, being paid for my work. Laura is a, an assistant professor, am I right, um, at the university. So uh, we need kicking sometimes. <laughs> and I think it's a, maybe a good point to turn it a bit to that. Like, how can, how can people who want to do the kicking and how do that, right? How um, how can they, you know, push for the solutions that maybe some pragmat from are developed from a pragmatic perspective that they are more just, uh, and maybe how can we become better at listening to those who do the kicking? Um, and I would like to start with Verle with this, um, and then open the floor for the panel again. Um, and also point out, I'll post it in the chat. I'll have another one of these Mentimeters. I'll give you a new code. Um, and then you can also do a little bit of wisdom of the crowd. Again, also raise your hand or put a QA and a or, or write in the chat and we'll discuss those points as well. But start with Werde. Um, how do young people, people who want to kick the system, do that? Um... I, I thought the question was more related to how do we open up institutionally or when we, when we are within the bounds of a rigid institution, how do we support the kicking? Um, that's how I interpreted the question. Um, I think we support the kicking, as simple as that. I think we must take the notion of solidarity very seriously, which means that we need to establish some sort of reciprocal relationship to avoid window dressing. So it's to not only um, invite the kickers uh, those who want to ruffle the feathers when it suits you, but um, establish a dynamic where you can work for each other and with each other so that it's, you know, there is something in it for everybody involved. Uh, so create space within the institution, no matter how rigid or politically difficult it might seem, because it is difficult and people will have an opinion. But that's not to say that a lot of feathers can be ruffled. And I think it's, it's fundamentally about that. So whether you're in an activist sphere, uh, like Raki Up is, like I am myself, um, or whether you're in an institution, there is always room for, um, well, in, in, in this particular case, decolonizing, decolonizing the climate discussion, opening up the panel, opening up the dialogue, inviting activists to be part of the conversation, and not just white activists, but especially indigenous activists, such as Raki Up. I think there is a lot to be won there. 
Um, I'll leave it at that. And, uh, Can I just come yeah. in there as well? Uh, I think I'd like to first hear from Mariam because we haven't okay, heard sure. from her in a while and then uh, back to you. Yes. Um, well, I think we're all part of different systems. First of, first of all, this system, I, yeah. Um, I think we all can do uh, many things and uh, we all have a history. I was, I was uh, also a student once and we were, uh, be, I was part of the uh, be Dutch vegan organization in the beginning of the nineties and there were 20 people at that time were a member. So people were saying that we were crazy to eat vegan. And uh, now you see that it's a hype, maybe mainly among uh, um, people with uh, who have the possibility to do it. But anyway, I want to say is you can always do things and you can always, uh, even if you're 80, 60, it doesn't matter. Um, and of course we need dialogue and we need transition. And there's a lot of knowledge on how to, how to uh, uh, effectively have transition. I mean, there are whole professorates on, on it. So we can also, it's not only about the goals we want, but also about the process. There's already hundred years of anthropology, re, anthropological research. It's not necessarily so that people in indigenous, uh, indigenous people also have power structures, you know? So like in companies or in tribes. So I think we, we need really, it's not to be real, relativistic, but to understand and to look and to touch upon what people really want. So, um, yeah, what is the best approach? Is the best approach to confront people or to uh, uh, to regulate? I, I think it's time now to start regulating, to have more and more regulations that go in the right direction. But that's because we have no time left. So uh, I agree that uh, with Raki, that it's an easy measure to give indigenous people more rights and we could have already a lot of things solved. Um, I think at the U United Nations, a lot of people already say this. Uh, why is it not happening? Because we have nation states, yeah, so we can go on and on. So um, I not, not, do not know the answer, but I don't like uh, simplifications, let's say that way, but I do like to address people directly and say that we all have a part to do. Thank you, Marian. Um, Bas, you already had your, had your hand up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, maybe just first of all to say that um, there is already a huge impact of the movement on the streets putting climate change and societal change on the agenda. It is affecting the political agenda substantially already. And I think maybe uh, the problem quite often is, is it going fast enough, right? And I think this is where you know, the movement is getting very annoyed that the change is not going fast enough. And that's because of the quite, quite, you know, difficulties in, in changing a slow system. You have to compare with an oil tanker that is changing its course, but it, it is taking time. And that is annoyingly slow. But, but I think it is always important to also really realize you are changing it already that the European Commission has now as its priority, the Green Deal has never been the case if there were not be Fridays for Futures. I mean, they made it possible that now the highest official of the European Commission is seriously talking about a Green Deal. What is now the danger is that of course, everyone jumps on that and using it in its own way in order to kind of you know, make it less harmful from their perspective. So to to you know to 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 less sh uh, to take the sharp edges out of it and stay, transfer it into a slowly changing thing. But the fundamental, if you read what the Green Deal is about, it is really a fundamental program, and this has only be possible because of Fridays for Futures, Greta Thunbergs, and all that. So they are having an impact. They are having an impact. Now, the biggest challenge comes, and this is where Marion said, yes, it is now. At, we are now getting at the time of regulation. How do we prevent that while doing the regulation, we get back into the normal regulatory framework where it is the lobby of this and the lobby of that? And then, unfortunately, the Fridays for Future lose out. And this is now, this is now uh, the biggest challenge. How to keep that urgency 
within the regulation, because the biggest problem with regulation is it's always sectoral. And then each sector becomes active as soon as it's a regulation on them. And then you get this famous attitude like, oh, I want to change, but, but they first. And they start pointing at each other and every regulation is being hauled down by the sector because they say, not us first. And I think this is really something that, that the challenge is how to keep the urgency there. But the agenda is really fundamentally changing. And that is already a success of, of kind of the movement out there changing into politics. Now, the big question is, will it be fast enough? And there, unfortunately, I can't give you comfort yet. I would love to, but there I can't. I think in many ways, that's, that's why we're all here, because we all know that it's not fast enough yet. But I, I still want to, you know, keep keep pushing us a little bit more. How can we how can we make sure this is happening faster and and happening in a in a fair and just way? Like, how can let's say young people that are starting to go to university or are in their studies, maybe, you know, definitely hitting the streets. I I I, I would never uh, question the efficacy of that. But what else can they do? How can they really get involved in this? Um, in, in, in making it happen and in getting their voices heard. Um, are there some direct ways that you see in your areas of research or your areas of practice or, or something? I, I would really like to push it a bit more in this. Vela, you have your hand up. Well, perhaps I can uh, yeah, say something small with that, because I think that Robin highlighted the last question that we wanted actually to move this discussion to. So can all the speakers, all the panelists perhaps mention some points for action for perhaps the young people who are in the audience now? But I also would not want to finish this event without uh, highlighting some of the questions that were also posed in the Q&A box, because that, I, that will be that would be, I would feel really sorry. So I've seen a very interesting question that was already posed before Marianne raised the veganism point. Uh, Constantine van Aertsen asks, should we eat the super rich instead of eating our planet? Um, and then Matthijs Boom also asked quite a long question, I think, relating to this reconciliation of the fundis and the realists. Uh, but he also later pointed out that this was already perhaps addressed. But then uh, San Lifaz asked, is there a route to coming out of shifting to pop the populist right in Europe, other than increasing the franchise, e.g. E uh, reducing voting age threshold to 12, for instance? Um, uh, and well, then Arthur also asked, uh, what does a clear financial program at the European level look like in your eyes to bus? Uh, I think I, 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 yeah, I just wanted to highlight these questions that were still open there in the Q&A box. And now let's move to all panelists, right, Robin, uh, and see uh, what if they can perhaps something in passing about those questions, but in any event address that key point that we wanted to address, namely what can young people do now in these coming 10 years, perhaps themselves. Uh, so we start with gert -Jan. Oh, you, you put me on the spot uh, right now. Um, oh, don't so, worry. If you, it's also you would no, it's no, that, that, that's obligatory. great. I was just, uh, uh, but I think uh, you, you know, um, w one thing that that I think uh, is uh, really useful uh, for a young generation, we, which I see both uh, well when I teach and also my uh, my kids who are age of uh, young young uh, students. Uh, that um, uh, different behaviors, uh, th that is really where a generational uh, uh, change uh, happens. So uh, uh, definitely, I think the whole uh, vegetarian, uh, vegan movement uh, is, is, a, uh, is a, a potentially a strong driver uh, that, that helps uh, mitigating uh, climate change. Um, I think another one where perhaps uh, young people, as far as I can see, are less strong, uh, but is, uh, well, have a different uh, travel behavior. Uh, I think those would be two uh, big ones uh, where really uh, generational change can make, uh, may make a true uh, difference. Uh, the other thing to say, echoing uh, boss, uh, which, um, 
<laughs> that's why we call it a patient for young people. When uh, when you're young and when you just uh, come to the issue, you don't appreciate uh, how how fast actually the pace of change is from one decade to the next. I've been in the field of alternative energy since 2000, and it grew in that period from nothing to something that is very big and really a power, powerful force for, for change. So uh, don't appreciate uh, how much the pace of change already is and how much different uh, life will be in, in 2030 and how much different attitudes will be in 2030. And it is that significantly due to uh, young people uh, pushing, but equally old people pushing, I will say. And people everywhere, by the way. And maybe uh, to say, I, I get here sort of a position, I'm sort of the Kopf von Jut here, which I'm fine with uh, being uh, to, to a degree. But I will say, and maybe, yeah, let, let me say that I worked uh, for, for 10 years, uh, well, I worked for 25 years in Shell, but more than 10 years uh, working on alternative energies for 10 years, uh, hammering on the door and informing uh, the leadership, really the top brass in Shell about what was happening in the energy transition. And uh, I led a very small think tank uh, out of which uh, Shell's new energy business eventually grew. Now, I won't give myself too much credit for that, and it was all in the making, uh, but um, don't underestimate uh, the agents of change that are uh, throughout society. Uh, it's not just young people who are woke at universities. Uh, it's equally, shall we say, old or middle-aged geezers in companies uh, who also strive to make the world a bit better. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gert Jan. Uh, I will move to the other panelists, but as we are actually already a bit over the time, I think we should try to keep it a bit brief. Uh, so please, uh, yeah, make it into a closing statement, highlight perhaps the most important. Uh, so I move to Marianne. Yeah, well, I, I find it a difficult question because I find it already a bit patronizing to tell other people what to do. and. Uh, I think that the, the more the question is, what can we learn from uh, young people that are courageous and uh, daring and uh, critical about existing hierarchies? So I would say um, people my age or whatever age uh, learn from this courage and, and questioning hierarchies. I think this is essential uh, because uh, although things maybe change if you are in the last decades, I think there are also a lot of things deteriorate. If you look at biodiversity, it's dramatic the last 20, 30 years. So we need even more courage and we need even more new political economies and new ways of working together. That's what I want to say. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, Verle. Yes, thank you. I just want to briefly say um, to young people like myself, don't get fooled by the myth that um, changing your consumer behavior will change the system because that is something that the, the status quo often likes to tell us. Uh, that is a myth, get political, put pressure on whatever environment is around you, uh, join movements, uh, read up on decolonialism, um, find ways to put pressure on structures that are clearly harmful um, I think it's beautiful to believe that we can change the world by being vegan and flying less, but that is in no way going to put enough pressure on the existing structures which need to be dismantled. Thank you very much, Verla. And then we end with Bas. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. Um, um, maybe, maybe just uh, very briefly on, on the question um, I'm now of Raki, eh? because he has a concrete one on protecting the rights of indigenous people. Uh, yes, of course, I, I see that as a very important goal. We are trying to get that into specific policies at the European level. For example, on a deforestation policy, we are working to enshrine also the rights of the indigenous people in that. Um, however, it, it will not be enough only. And I'm not saying you say that, but there, there is, of course, there are on the other fundamental changes that need it. This is an important one, and I think it should be needed and is needed, but it's not the only thing that needs to be solved. I think on just in increasing the franchise, I think 
this is one of the reasons why all the green parties all over Europe are having that the, that the, 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 the age of, of uh, being allowed to elect should go down to 16. I haven't seen 12 yet indeed, but 16 for sure. And I also sincerely believe in that. If you see what we are expecting from people from 16 years onwards, what they should do, I can't see why that voting uh, is not part of that. So for me, that is certainly uh, one, but it is a bit of a pragmatic one. And that's, that's I think, uh, absolutely. Um, maybe the last point that I want to make, and that's uh, on Robin's question. Um, interestingly enough, at the European level, policymakers have been struggling now for decades on how to create a European space, right? A European space of debate. Fridays for Futures have succeeded in that. They have probably did the best result in creating a European space. I was during the European elections in 2019. I was the head of list of the Greens, the European Greens. So I have been traveling to all the European countries. And in each capital, we had there on Friday, the Friday for Future marches. That, those, those were the days when we could do that. And it was everywhere. There was a huge difference in on how big it was. Eh? In Stockholm, it was huge. In Budapest, it was 15 people, but they did it. And because they were all inspired by each other, they had the feeling, I can do it here in Budapest because I know I'm not alone. Whereas probably 10 years ago, you would have felt alone if you would walk there with 15 people. You don't have that anymore. And that is impacting in each capital policymakers in some countries slower than the others, but the debate is really changing. And this is probably the, only, the most important part that I can say. Please keep on doing it and don't despair on it. The change is happening. And also there I saw Eric saying, well, you know, Green Deal, everyone is now embracing it, but it doesn't mean anything. That is not true. The problem is, however, it's not regarded as a fundamental change by all. We're not there yet. But even within the companies, you see now some of them really see it like, yeah, we need to change. And that is more than just, you know, doing some greenwashing. But it's true. It's not all. And therefore, all these umbrella organizations, they are the worst, you know. Umbrella organizations who are influencing policymakers, they are usually representing the lowest common denominator instead of the ones that are leading. That's our fundamental problem. And that's where you should be kicking at. Veno and Sway for the Dutch audience, they are representing all the Dutch companies and they are representing it by taking an average of it. There it goes wrong because the average is still too slow. But why is Veno and Sway not far more supporting only the ones who want to go faster? Because they are there. There are leaders and there are laggards. And by the way, Shell for me is still a laggard, Gertje. I'm sorry for that, but there are leaders. And I think this is, this is where, uh, where we really also should not only change the politicians, but also all these so-called representative bodies, because quite often they're not representative anymore. They are really representing the lowest common denominator. And I think they're also... If you want to do something, keep on organizing, keep on creating your European and global space, but also really go at these kind of umbrella organizations because they are much more powerful than you think and than you want. Maybe I'll leave it to that. Thank you so much, Bas. Those were wonderful words, I think, to close off this webinar. I would like to uh, thank everyone and ask all the speakers to stay with us. But uh, of course, I want to thank, well, firstly, all the speakers. Gert-Jan Kramer, thank you very much for being here. Marianne Stuiver, it was fantastic to have you. Verle Engel, thank you so much for your contribution. And Bas Eichhout, also thanks very much to you. Uh, of course, also thanks to Robin uh, and to the, organ uh, to the organizers behind the scenes, the people from the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, Lisa Saris and Gijs van der Starre and Kertu Euval. Thank you so much. And last but not least, thanks a lot to the audience. Thanks uh, a lot for having been here and asking your questions and wishing you a great afternoon. Thanks. Mm -hmm.